God is good. He doesn't have a day off. God is good. And who are the beloved of God? Put your hand up. Oh, we got that right. Beautiful. It's a good start. God is good and we are his beloved. That's always a good foundation to receive the word. Let's just pray for a moment because uh, I'm going to go through a few things this morning which I hope will give you context, understanding. And I'm going to teach a little bit this morning um, because I, I really do want to impress something upon you uh, about who we're becoming as the church uh, and why it is so important that we keep the scriptural blueprint firmly in our heart as we go forward, that we don't get swayed by the pull of the world, but we get swayed by the pull of heaven. So, Father, I thank you for the power of your word. They are spirit and they are life. Lord, I thank you that these are your holy words towards us to encourage us to build faith and to have hope. Lord, I pray for the Holy Spirit to move even in our hearts now, to open our hearts that we may hear, that we may receive, and that we may become all that you've called us to become in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the title for this morning, if you're making notes, is Looking Back and Going Forward. Looking back and going forward. And there are times when it is good to remember the past, especially when those events act as testimonials of God's goodness. We've sung about that this morning. His promises and the kingdom breaking into our lives. Of course, Paul the Apostle teaches us to let go of what is behind so that we may lay hold of what is ahead. We don't live in the past. And certainly God's intention, it seems, is always one of increase, development and momentum into the future. However, we can celebrate and be thankful for the things God has done. And we know from the book of Numbers, chapter 13, that momentum is God, in God is built by celebrating both what God has done, what he has promised, and what he is doing. Not what has not happened and what is not happening. To create momentum into the future, leaving the past behind, we celebrate. We give thanks to God for everything. The big things, the little things, what has been revealed to our hearts in the times of blessing and times of adversity and overcoming. And it's also important to remember that what was a peripheral part of Israel's journey in the Old Testament with respect to apocalyptic narrative, that's a big word, means of spiritual forces opposing the people of God. It does take center stage in Jesus, the Gospels and the New Testament. Hence, Jesus taught that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take hold of it by force. Meaning, of course, we do face spiritual opposition in the promises, plans and purposes of God being outworked in our lives. In both the Old and the New Testaments, we find that God has no equal. He is supreme. In the New Testament, the conquering king has now come and he is causing all things, say all, all, all things to be restored. His church, which is his family, his overcomers, will accomplish this as they carry God's life in them into reality in everyday life and God's commission. Like Jesus... For a while, it looks like the things are working against us. Again, it can look like not much is happening in the world around us. We can even feel ineffective in our mission as a church. But Jesus taught the kingdom is in you. And it must be carried into this world with discernment, intentionality, God's love and faith, and with a resolve and purpose. It's pretty clear we cannot come into our calling and our mission as the church apart from Christ. We do it in him and from him and as Paul said, to him, to his praise and to his glory. Whilst God has opened up the kingdom to us and being born again, we perceive it in our heart and we enter into it by faith 
to give expression to it from our hearts. The spirit of the world and dark spiritual forces also work against God's plans and his people to prevent them from laying hold of what God has already opened up to them and planned for them to establish by living in Christ. We have a hope of significant value that should never be lost in spiritual conflict we sometimes engage in when living in the realities of the Holy Spirit. To bring context and understanding, we are indeed a, in a spiritual cosmic battle to bring forward the kingdom of heaven as God's family, his kings and priests, into this world in an increasing measure. The kingdom is at hand, and by co-laboring with God, we are to cause it to break in to every area of our life. There will be times when things go smoothly, and there are times when we will feel we are in the heat of a spiritual battle. Hence, to our faith, we are to add perseverance, and we are called to be overcomers and more than conquerors in Christ. Can I get an amen this morning? I want to talk for a moment about this, the necessity of spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment is a fundamental requirement in our journey going forward, just as Paul the Apostle taught and instructed the early church. His charge to the church was of great encouragement. Let me read it to you. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Sometimes we forget we've got an enemy that's working against us. If you don't have an opponent, you can't have a victory. You can't have a victorious life without a battle. It's nonsensical. The idea that we're not in a cosmic battle is absolute fantasy. Paul makes it really clear. What was peripheral in the Old Testament has now come centerpiece in the New Testament. Jesus took on the works of Satan to destroy them. He didn't back off. He didn't resile. He understood the schemes of the enemy. And he, now he's empowered us Amen. with the spiritual discernment through his truth to do the same thing. To prosecute diligently the finished work of his suffering. Amen. Can I get an Amen. Yes, Satan has a strategy to work against us, our mission, our relationships, our community, God's promises and our full potential in Christ. He will exploit the unresolved issues of the heart. He will exploit the unresolved issues of the heart. And he will exploit whatever he can in our thoughts and life that is not yet yielded and taken up in Christ. It's a very important point. Against that, however, there's a but. We have a might, God's might, a power from God and the Holy Spirit to overcome and to use God's truth and wisdom to recognize every one of Satan's schemes and then dismantle them yeah. by moving in the way of humility and God's love and truth, con choosing to continually give him praise and thanks in every single circumstance. You can join with me, yell out, Amen, all you want this morning because I want an agreement on earth as it already is in heaven. Thanksgiving leading to continual praise is a spiritual weapon that destroys the works of the enemy in our salvation journey and mission and keeps our heart spiritually alert to Satan's schemes. Paul goes on and says this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. It is clear that not only does God want us to be aware of these spiritual realities, he calls us into developing spiritual maturity 
so that through spiritual discernment and God's might and wisdom, we bring forward his kingdom in every area of our life and our spheres of influence that he has given to us. Satan may look like he's winning for a while, but he doesn't win overall. We are called to numerous spheres of influence as the church. I want to talk about that for a moment. We each have numerous spheres of influence. The first is in our own heart. How we govern our heart determines how we govern our life and all the other spheres of influence God has given us. Of course, the first place that his kingdom needs to be established is in our own heart. God does this through Jesus and by us living in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He gives us both his present words, his rhema words, and the written word, the logos, or the scriptures, and the Holy Spirit to reveal things to our heart and to lead us and guide us. God also uses godly men and women. He uses men and women, godly men and women, inspired and led by the Holy Spirit to walk with us and guide us and teach us. What is in our hearts will be what we carry in our hands. What we carry in our hearts will be what we reveal in our life. It will shape our priorities, our pursuits, our values, and our beliefs. The next sphere of influence is our marriage, if we're married. Then the next that flows from that is in our home, our family. Whether we are parents or children in a household, we are given a sphere of influence and responsibility to create the atmosphere of heaven on earth. In short... We are to live godly lives before others in our home. Then we have a sphere of influence that extends to the church. Yes, the church. The spiritual house where God has planted us to grow and mature into who he has called us to become and as spiritual sons and daughters who carry the heart of Jesus And rule their lives with the heart of a servant and serve others with the heart of a king. As we together, say together, fulfill, say fulfill, God's commission and purposes on earth. We do it together. Not one for the rest. Each one playing their part. Everyone who is saved by God, restored to the Father through believing in Jesus, has entered into God's household. Just as in our natural homes, so we have a sphere of influence and responsibility in God's house. We have both spiritual responsibilities and practical responsibilities. Not only are we co-laboring to ensure the household is a godly household and the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit and God's glory, We are each given responsibilities to ensure the household flourishes as we co-labor with God. As we co-labor with God in Christ. We are to receive and to give expression to God's love. The strong in faith are to look after and assist the weaker ones in their faith. Didn't say the pastor has to do that. He should do that, but he's not the only one that should do that. I'm not buck passing this morning. I'm just sharing the load. We are to be generous towards each other. We are to consider each other. We are to pray together and for each other. And where necessary, we're to provide for each other. And we're to forgive each other. And we're to encourage each other and build others up so they may be strong in the Lord. We are to prefer one another, submit in God's love to one another, and we are to honour those who lead us. Thank you. 
And this is just the beginning of what Paul says is appropriate for God's household. These, there are responsibilities in the house and from the house in bringing forward the kingdom as light into increasing light and light into darkness. Also, we each have a sphere of influence in the world. So we've got lots of spheres of influence. And none of these spheres of influence are mutually exclusive. It's not either or. It's and. I am to influence my home and influence in the church and beyond the church. I am to influence in the church and into my workplace, wherever I go. I am to be an influencer. I am to be the light in the darkness wherever I go. Why? Because that's who I am. Ultimately, what we establish in our hearts is in each sphere is crucial. As we give expression to our sonship, our kingship, and our priestly responsibilities. This is part of what each of us are called to live and function in, empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're not meant to do it in our own strength. We've got a might, a power, an enabling. The Holy Spirit, God himself empowering us into this reality. All right, let's look about co-laboring with God in good works. There are certain things in the blueprint of Scripture that cause us to become spiritually mature people, not just to possess God's promises, but to also enter into the good works God has planned for each of us to do, to fulfill His mission. A co-mission, his mission, that we are all involved in. Say all. all. You've been drafted. You've been conscripted. Maybe you didn't read the blueprint when you took the easy salvation message. But I hope you genuinely came to Jesus so that you would say no to your old life, and that you would fully embrace his life. Now, his life has a purpose to it. And you've not only loved, but you've been given purpose. There's a purpose for your life. How many of you have been looking for purpose in your life? Well, here it is, all in the scripture. God has planned for each of us good works. These good works vary and start in a very simple way. These good works are part of our calling and our prophetic destiny as individuals and as a community. We've just not entered into the life of Christ through our salvation. We have not just entered into the promises of God. We have entered, listen carefully, we have entered into the future kingdom. We have entered in now to an eternal realm. We have entered in now. And that is meant to be outworked in the present through every decision of our life. We therefore live from the eternal perspective in our decisions and heart attitudes. The future kingdom that is yet fully to come is breaking into the darkness of everyday life in the present. The kingdom is often lived in the mundane realities of ordinary life through our multiple spheres of influence. And sometimes the kingdom outworking it seems invisible. Who's felt that? And sometimes it's really visible. Who's felt that? But for the most part, although though I and you, we like the spectacular... The kingdom is steady as she goes, line upon line, precept upon precept, one step after the other, committed going forward. By entering into the kingdom of God, we have therefore entered into God's purposes and his mission into the world. I will come to that a little bit more. 
what we are developing and thankful for. We've learned this last year how to become a community who values the presence of God and the requirement to participate, say participate, in giving him praise. See, that was a bit of a trap. That was a participation question for you to participate in. We are learning to value the presence of God and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit when we worship God, listen to this, with all our mind, all of our will, all of our emotion, and all of our imagination. In short, with all of our heart and all of our body. Worship is not holding stuff back. It's giving it all to the one who gave it all. Praise is not just singing a worship song. It's an attitude of the heart in everything. Paul instructs us to do everything with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is counterintuitive. It's it's not a worldly response, but it's a heavenly response. That's how you break the hold of the world in you because what the world wants to moan about, you want to give thanks about. Are you hearing me this morning? Thanksgiving is counterintuitive to the world, but it is intuitive of heaven. Thanksgiving keeps our hearts humble and gracious towards God and builds a culture of faith and hope in our lives and in our conversations with others. There is a real transforming in our lives when we learn how to be thankful and to remind ourselves of how blessed we are no matter what our circumstances. The neuroscience. I've looked at the evidence, the scientific evidence of all the studies of thankfulness and prayer. And they says it has a transforming effect on your mind, on the longevity of your mind, your alertness, and your imagination is engaged to experience God. That's the science. Supports the scripture. And as I've said, God often produces the greatest blessings in the most ridiculous and impossible situations. Who's experienced that? It's important to keep a thankful heart and to strengthen ourselves in the Lord when we go through all kinds of trials and adverse situations. In those moments, God is moving in ways that if we see God opportunity in adversity, God opportunity in adversity, and give Him praise and thanks, He will make provision Establish another part of his promise towards us and anoint us right there in the middle of the situation we're in. What Satan tries to use to take you out, God uses to build you up. We engage in God's power when we choose to offer our sacrifice of praise and give him glory and honour as a community. There is something very powerful When a church comes together to worship God and engage with the Holy Spirit as their first priority. Not what programs have we got going. Our first priority is to give Him praise, to give Him glory every time we come together. We are going to give Him praise and we're going to give Him glory and we're going to give thanks before we do another thing. Why? Because that's our first priority. I think God might have been on that. As I suggested earlier, it becomes a very powerful weapon in our spiritual arsenal to create breakthrough and to destroy the works of the spirit of this world that is trying to work against us. That is why we have to be very intentional about worshipping and having people engage in worship. It establishes in the congregation the centrality of Christ, which helps us take our eyes off of ourself and put them back on him. What we behold is what we become. 
So learning how to become a priesthood of worshippers is fundamental to us learning how to live in God's power and authority. Are you still with me this morning? We have also learned and are learning how to come together and pray. Our Wednesday nights have been a powerful time of prayer and worship and us learning how to be led by the Holy Spirit in prayer so that he can lead us how to pray and for us to pray effectively. Who wants effective prayer? The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. A righteous person flows with the Holy Spirit, flows from what's happening in heaven to declare it on earth to make the petitions and the requests of God's own heart for our present situation. He has a prayer solution to every life situation we go through. He wants to build his people up and he wants to reveal the kingdom through them. We've also learned many things about our priestly calling as believers. We need to be together on these nights Praying effectively as one people. As one people. Praying effectively. We're going to see the shift that we want to see as a community. It has to involve worship and prayer as the fundamentals. Amen? Some things need to shift in the next season. And prayer must take on a unified, committed an effective approach. We have learned and are learning how to lead the church by the Holy Spirit from a relational wineskin that allows the ebb and flow of life and maturity to take place in an organized but not a controlling environment. Our leadership model is based on Jesus and how he coached and directed his disciples into the reality of the life of God and the purposes of God that he was living. Some people prefer a far more practical and a directional structure and more programs. Jesus never once adopted a program style of participation. Jesus was about his father's business, God's purposes in all he did. He embraced a calling and a heart response to God in outworking the practical calling and mission of his life. Whilst we are practical, and I'll come to that a bit more in a minute, we must ensure first things are first. The pattern that Jesus describes for us is to first walk with him. Walk with him. Then work with him. And as we do those things, to learn from him as an ongoing experience. We're to first walk with him, then work with him and learn the way he does it. This was the teaching to the apostles, the foundational fathers of the early church. Jesus becomes the model in all that we do. Working without God or not walking with Jesus first has no eternal reward. We can be busy with a million programs and religious activity and still be ineffective in our faith and bringing forward the kingdom of heaven and have no eternal rewards for our effort. I want to state that so clearly. This is nothing more than fleshly religion. It creates a wardrobe malfunction and has absolutely no eternal reward or reality. Doing amazing things and never ending programs, but not carrying the heart of God with faith and to achieve God's purposes are absolutely pointless. They just wear us out with no godly outcome, development or eternal reality. Do I get an amen this morning? We want our time and commitment to our mutual callings to count both here on earth and eternally. Who has time to waste? 
The one thing that Satan steals is our time. The one thing we need to be effective with is how we use our time. Amen? We get to make time decisions every day. Do you know that some, I did a study on this. Some people spend more time in front of the mirror and the toilet than they do coming together as the church. I'm serious. I did a time study. If you do a time study of how much time you spend in the mirror per week, as opposed to how much time you spend in prayer, coming together, building each other up, watch the numbers. Do a study for yourself. Then you'll see where your priorities are. Just saying. Now, I don't know about you, but Netflix has no return or reward for me. I enjoy watching Netflix every now and then. But if that is the priority of my world, I'm in the world. I'm not in Jesus. Amen? I have nothing against Netflix, by the way. So, in any development, there'll be some bumps. There'll be growing pains. There'll be a spiritual enemy who will do all he can to destroy what God is committed to building and establishing in and through his church. And as people grow, and not everyone grows at the same pace, old relationships become strained and emotions in those relationships are always the seedbed for Satan and dark spiritual powers to create division and destroy destinies in people. How many times do you read about a church split or disunity or murmuring and gossiping that has caused the destiny of a group of people to be derailed? What happens is Satan trades on the love wounds of the heart to create animosity, division and deference. And so instead of forgiving each other, keeping short accounts, we blame each other. We say, oh, well, I'm not welcome there. I'm not this and I'm not that. All the while, God says, what are you listening to? Are you listening to me or are you listening to the inspiration of the enemy provoking those things? I want you to come and surrender to me that I may make you whole. Amen. We are looking to develop those people that want to be leaders and influencers, not just in the church community, but also from the church community. Those people that want to influence their generation and others around them so that the reality of Jesus may be revealed through them. Those who want to be uncommon and inspirational in the world. I would love to see an inspirational People start to transform the world around them. It starts with what I carry in my heart. So coming back to my original point, we give thanks that God uses all things. He uses the adversity. He does use the conflict, the bumps, the smooth, straight stretches, the blessing, the promises and the breakthroughs. Nothing is wasted on the way if we are willing to, to remain humble of heart and teachable. This is what Paul says in the book of Romans. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Oh, come on. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. God is the greatest cheerleader you will ever have of your prophetic future. He is in heaven, not only cheering you on, praying that you will succeed, praying that you will overcome the works of the enemy, praying that you'll love how he loved, praying that you'll have his faith. That is the hope we have the world needs. And we know all things work together. This is Paul speaking. And we know that all things work together for good. To those who love God. To those who are called according to His purposes. 
Not just being loved, but called according to his purposes. Will we have a battle? Yes, we will. But we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We are armed with a victory. We are armed with an authority. We are armed with a power. We are armed with a life that dismantles the works of the enemy. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Say, I'm called. I'm called. Whom he justified, I am justified. I am. And these he also will glorify. Say, I'm glorified. What can we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? There's little doubt to my mind that God's community is to be a place where people grow in spiritual maturity and also a place where God's calling to be conformed to the likeness of Christ is reinforced in the hearts of all leaders and believers by the Holy Spirit. And so that in growing maturity, we also fulfill our mission. The very reasons we exist as God's community. We don't exist for ourselves. We exist for Him. You need to hear that this morning. We don't exist for ourselves. We exist for Him. I have been brought into a relationship with my Father. That I may be about my father's business, just like Jesus. Oh my goodness. And this mission is so important to the world like never, ever before. In 2018 is a year that we will be giving greater effect to our commission in a more practical and intentional way. Let me just tie some things together to see the importance of our commissioning and co-laboring with and in Christ. Let me start with God's mission in Genesis and our need to co-labor. God's continuing theme throughout the Bible is that he wants a people in right relationship with him to live from his presence and in his image and likeness to bring forward the rule and reign of the kingdom of heaven on earth. That was the starting point in Genesis. God placed Adam and Eve in a garden. Now, I'm going to talk about the garden a bit as a prophetic metaphor, but it's both a place and a prophetic metaphor. And there's a bit of teaching here that's important to understand. It was the first temple. The garden was the first temple in Jewish thought, where both Adam and Eve were given their assignment and mandate. Their commission was given in and from the glory. You need to understand that. Maybe that's a little deep for some this morning. But we'll work through that this next year. They were to increase the borders of the garden to cover the earth so that not only would the glory presence of God cover the earth, but also the knowledge of the glory of God would cover the earth. That glory points obviously to Jesus And also his rule and reign, bringing peace and goodwill to all men. Mankind living from the spiritual presence of God was designed to work and protect the garden, the glory. In the teaching of Jesus, the garden and the condition of the soil in the garden is used as a metaphor for the heart of man. He ties Genesis in to his parable for the seed, the sower of the seed. He's bringing things together in a unique way. Then the Genesis imagery of the garden is not only a place and the geography of the first temple, but as I said, a prophetic metaphor of God's ultimate dwelling place on earth in the heart of man. And understand that. We are to live 
from that manifest reality in our heart. This is why Jesus talks about the heart more than any other topic through his teachings. Because it is the dwelling place of heaven on earth. You are designed to be the temple where God dwells in his glory. My goodness me. My goodness me. The condition of our heart is important to God's calling and the mission we take up. Hence, we are not to get into the mission in our own works, but from his glory, by his power, by his strength, as Dave brought the word. So in the New Testament, through salvation by God's grace, say God's grace, we find that God takes up his dwelling, not with man, But as I said, puts his glory, his glory in the heart of man. Uh, That's inconceivable, isn't it, Erna? You're shaking. I mean, we're allowed to go, what the heck? And so you should, because I don't think yet we've really apprehended the truth of this matter. Because if it did, we'd be living a little bit differently. I would be living. I've still got to get my head around this. And I want to get my head around it. Because it's true. I've got to bring my life to the truth, not what I thought it was about, but what it's actually about. Then the Genesis imagery of the garden is very important. We are to live from that manifest reality in our heart. To do that, we must renew our mind, no longer holding to the pattern of this fallen world and its attitudes and systems. We must see things differently so we can expand the borders of what we all carry in our heart. See, you're expanding the borders of one kingdom or another because of what's in your heart. If your heart is still locked in the world and you haven't yielded those things to Christ, it will manifest that kingdom. But where you're fully yielded, fully given over, all the issues of your life are given to him that he may heal you and establish his life in you. That is when the kingdom flows from you. Amen. 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 The issues of the heart are really important. When I took this church from JD, when the Lord spoke to me in June of that year, Tracy was mortified that I was even hearing God in these terms. I was being presumptuous. I was being whatever else, but I heard God. And this is what he said to me, Gateway, and this is what my mandate is. Let me have their hearts so they can have their future. Let me have their hearts so that they can have their future. Everything of the kingdom is heart to heart and heart to heart. It's heart to heart and heart to heart. We must renew our mind and start to see things from God's point of view, not our past and our history's point of view. We to see things differently as led by the Holy Spirit. And this is why Jesus said to Nathaniel that he would see even more spectacular things than Jesus moving in the spirit of knowledge, seeing him under the fig tree in calling him to service. He said to Nathaniel, you think that's spectacular? Wait till you see angels descending and ascending upon the Son of Man. That's a curious statement to make to Nathaniel who probably went, I'm clueless of what you're even talking about. He was showing us that the temple and its construction in the Old Testament actually pointed to him. Now, God does not build his temple in a building, but in a people. The church is not a place, but a people. And those people are meant to carry the meeting place between heaven and earth, everywhere they go. The people with hearts joined together in God's love as his family embracing his purposes and commission now become the functioning temple, that place. And as a result, the church as a people has been given delegated kingdom authority 
to cause that reality of the glory presence in the temple and the knowledge of that glory presence to go throughout the whole world. That is why it is important that we continue to be of one heart and one mind. We share this gospel reality and want to see it outworked in a practical way. Hence, Jesus says that each of us together become the eternal city on a hill. God gives us platforms from which to shine. We are not to hide our light of Christ in us away. We are not to be people hidden from the darkness or hiding from or in the darkness. We are to be the light in to the darkness. We are not to be fearful, but bold and courageous. For the darkness is no match for the unified expression, the unified expression, the unified expression of the light we carry. We, together, revealing Christ, are the light of the world. For he was the light of the world. And what he saw in himself, he would translate into a people. What he carried in himself, as a seed dies and goes to the ground. So therefore, there would be many people that would carry what he carried. Oh, Satan thought he'd won at the cross. God had another plan. It looked like Jesus was losing all the while he was winning. See, the same with us. Sometimes it looks like we're losing, but all the while we're winning. We just have to learn how God's mystery and the kingdom unfolds in our life. We've got to get out of the flesh and get into heaven. Amen? Now, the scriptures are really interesting because when Jesus had defeated death, the final frontier of darkness. When Jesus had defeated the enemy absolutely, he went and he set the captives free. Can you imagine that scene? He made a mockery of Satan. Satan was gloating. Oh, we got a trophy. We got Jesus. He said, I come down here to exercise my governmental authority. Thank you very much. And I will take back what belongs to humanity in relationship with me. Game over, Satan. You see, our job is to lay hold of that reality. It's not superficial. It's outworked in a battle. It's outworked, but we hold the keys. The church holds the keys. Now, will Satan try and get you off course? You bet he will. Will he try to get you to be winning, whining and moaning and doing all those things that start with a B? Yes, he will. Will he get you distracted? Will he get you off course? Will he get you where you don't want to be? Yeah, why? Because you're used to living in his world. You are used to living in his world more than you're used to living in God's world. And what God is saying, time to come out of the world, church, and come into my world to be powerful in the world. There is a reality of Matthew 28, 18, that all authority has been given to me, Jesus said, in heaven and on earth. There is no authority from God's point of view that is lacking. He has all authority. Say all. all. Now, who does he delegate all that authority to? Us. Yep. My goodness me. Go. Therefore, why? Because you've now got the keys. You've now got something that you, no other generation had. Before Jesus, Israel lost the keys. They didn't have the keys. But because of Jesus, we got the keys. If you've got the keys, drive the car, for goodness sake. It's powerful. Learn how to drive it correctly. Don't crash it. You might spin the wheels for a while, but you'll get traction. I'm telling you, we're not used to the power and the authority of God. We're still used to the power and authority of the world. We've got to start getting used to the power and authority of God in our lives as children, as sons and daughters of the God Most High. And so we're going to go. Next season is about going. It's about going. 
Not leaving, going. Going. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Make disciples. Talmudin of all nations. Of all nations. Of all people. Baptizing them. Fully immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So be it. They're the words of Jesus. That's the great commission to you and I. And we can't fulfill the great commission without loving God and loving one another. The Great Commission is founded on God's love, God's pursuit of the nations. Why? Because they're in bondage. They're in darkness. They've been fractured. They're in the hold of darkness. And God has said, will you be my people to go and get those who are in darkness, who are in bondage, and they know no clue where they're living. But I want to tell you that the church needs to rise up because the world is crying out for authentic, real experiences with Jesus Christ. We are going to move differently next year with our emphasis about discipling a people who can disciple nations. Teaching doesn't look like us just sitting. It looks so different. I want to talk about that next year. It looks so different. We've adopted a world model in church of learning instead of a Jesus model of learning. And we're going to move to a Jesus model of learning. You know why? Because it breaks all the barriers. It breaks all the limitations. It breaks the boxes we've been sitting in. It breaks the religious mindset and protocol. And I want to tell you, if you don't like being uncomfortable, you might find it troublesome next year. If you want to be comfortable, stay home and watch Netflix. If you want to get on board with Jesus, bring your friends. Let's get on with it. Let's get going. Why? Because the world is crying out for Jesus. And we have been given the keys to unlock the world out of darkness and bring them back to the place God always intended for them to live from. Amen? Amen. Who is going to look forward to a new year in 2008? Who's got a faith and a hope? We've had a battle as a family, but I want to tell you that battle is not over because we're about to enforce the reality of what has been stolen. We're about to enforce the reality of what has been stolen. Why? Because as a seed goes into the ground, even more life comes out of it. As the seed goes into the ground, more life comes out of it. And we're positioning ourselves for the more as a family, as a church, as a people, for a city and for a nation. Can I get an amen this morning? Let's pray together. If this has stirred your heart in anything, Let's just start to pray and say, Lord, I heard that word this morning. And that is a word that stirs my heart. I want to come into it. You just start to pray. You see, part of it is to get you activated, you participating, us all coming to maturity. So I want a holy din here because I'm really excited. The anointing fell on me halfway through. And I've got ants in my pants again. I've got a fire in my belly. And look out. It's dangerous for you. It's really dangerous for you. It's dangerous for the leaders. It's dangerous for my family. Because I know today is a day I draw a line in the sand and I say some of the things that I gave myself to in 2017 is not part of my future in 2018. I'm turning away from some of those things that I got caught up in to embrace what I want, the one I want to be caught up in. I'm turning away from that that I may fully come to Him. You see, that's what it's about. I don't have to live in regret. I live in the testimonies of his goodness to build my faith, to approach the future because I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus and we are together. 
If one man can do amazing things, how much can a people do amazing things? Just have faith and believe again. Pray away. Pray away. Your prayers. Just start to thank him. Stand. Do whatever you want. But I I, I want you to pray this morning. I want you to pray this morning with zeal, with fire, with a passion. It says, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, here I am. Use me. Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Transform me. I don't want to leave the same way I came in. I'm leaving this morning different, Lord. I thank you for your future. I thank you for the prophetic words. I thank you for the calling. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your promises. Lord, I thank you for a fresh anointing this morning. I thank you for a fresh vision this morning. Oh Lord, and let my vision rise up to your vision and let your vision become my vision. For surely you've called me to be inspirational. For surely you've called me to be uncommon in this world. For surely you've called me to be light in the darkness. Lord, I need more love. I need to receive more of your love this morning. Fill me up with your love, Lord. Fill me up. I need more revelation. I need more understanding. Lord, bring the spirit of wisdom. Bring the spirit of revelation. Lord, fill me up with who you are. Fill me up that I overflow. Lord, fill me up that I can be poured out as a drink offering for your glory, for this city and for this nation. Lord, bless Adelaide. Bless every church in Adelaide. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, whatever their expression, whatever their theology, let them be blessed blessed, Lord. Let them turn their hearts to you if they've turned to the world. Let them come in to everything that you said they can come into. Lord, dismantle the issues of pride in our heart that we may come together as one. Lord, what you can do in unity is far more powerful than what you can do in division. Lord, division is not your economy. Your economy is multiplication. Not addition, multiplication. Lord, we ask for the multiplication We ask for the multiplication, the supernatural increase that comes through you this morning. Bless our homes, Lord. Bless our families. Bless our workplace, Lord. Bless wherever we go. Whatever we touch, let it reveal your goodness, your love, your peace, and your goodwill to man. Come on, let's raise our voices this morning. Let's stand before the Lord. Let's stand before the Lord. Can the worship team come up, please? I'm sorry, I'm all fired up this morning. Put on Jesus. I just feel, put on Jesus. You're not leaving the same. If you've come here this morning, you're not, you're not going to leave the same. There's something God wants to do with you even before you leave. Open your heart to Him. Let the Holy Spirit come. Let these words become life to you. Jesus doesn't want you to just hear it. He wants you to go and live it. Come on, there should be a holy din in this place. Holy din in this place. Start to declare who you are in God. Start to declare that you are called. Start to declare that you are loved, that you are a son, that you're a daughter. And God has given you plans and purposes. He's gifted you. He's gifted you. You're anointed. You're anointed. Say, I'm anointed. I'm the anointed of God to do amazing things in the world. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Let's get past. Let's break the five minute barrier. Hey, let's break the five minute barrier. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let us go this morning with a fresh revelation. Let us go this morning with a fresh life application. 
We ask for your wisdom. Lord, that you would give us Solomon's heart, a heart that wants understanding, a heart that wants to know you, Lord. Lord, we're done with the way the world does stuff, Lord. We want the world to see how heaven does things, Lord. We want your glory to be known, Lord. We want you to be known, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.